What laissez-faire? Sheldon Richman, 2010. Writing in The Guardian last January under the headline Caribbean Communism vs. Capitalism, respected journalist Stefan Kinzer began his article like this. Visiting unhappy Cuba is especially thought-provoking for anyone familiar with its unhappy neighbors. Cubans live difficult lives and have much to complain about. So do Jamaicans, Dominicans, Haitians, Guatemalans, Hondurans, Salvadorans, and others in the Caribbean basin who live under capitalist governments. Who is worse off? Does an ordinary person live better in Cuba or in a nearby capitalist country? Footnote. Stefan Kinzer, Caribbean Communism versus Capitalism. The Guardian. Guardian News and Media. January 22, 2010. Guardian.co.uk. Many people would read this without pause, but presumably not libertarians. Are Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador capitalist countries? Kinzer's matter-of-fact statement seems to conflict with other evidence. For example, the Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom, which overstates countries' degree of economic freedom, rates the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, El Salvador, and Guatemala moderately free, and not free or mostly free, and Honduras and Haiti mostly unfree. So how can they be capitalist unless capitalism and freedom are two different things? One may infer from Kinzer's article that he classifies any country capitalist as long as Marxist socialism is not its official ideology. So he states, comparing the two political and social systems also reminds us that for many people in the world, a truly fulfilling life is unattainable, the best hope for longtime communist Cuba and its longtime capitalist neighbors would be to learn from each other. My purpose here is not to focus on Kinzer's curiously positive statements about Cuba and its social safety net, but rather on his use of the word capitalist. He apparently regards that designation so uncontroversial that he feels no need to justify it or even to define the term. Kinzer, however, is not an anomaly. Consider Richard Posner's book about the recent financial debacle, A Failure of Capitalism. Posner is no left-leaning journalist. He's a federal judge with a long association with the University of Chicago and the market-oriented law and economics movement. Yet here he is blaming capitalism for the current economic troubles and, as a result, embracing Keynesianism. He writes in his preface, We are learning from it, the Depression, that we need a more active and intelligent government to keep our model of a capitalist economy from running off the rails. The movement to deregulate the financial industry went too far by exaggerating the resilience, the self-healing powers, of laissez-faire capitalism. Posner is hardly a lone wolf on his side of the political spectrum. Tune in to the financial programs on the Fox News Channel and Fox Business Network any day, and you'll hear Lawrence Kudlow, Ben Stein, or any number of other economic conservatives warning that Barack Obama's policies threaten to undermine our capitalist system. That certainly implies that there is today a capitalist system to undermine. What is capitalism? What, then, is this system called capitalism? It can't be the free market because we have no free market. Today, the hand of government is all over the economy, from money and banking to transportation to manufacturing to agriculture to insurance to basic research to world trade. If the meaning of a concept consists in how it is used, there is no platonic form to be divined, capitalism can't mean the free market. Rather, it designates a system in which the means of production are de jure privately owned. Left open is the question of government intervention. Thus, the phrases free market capitalism and laissez-faire capitalism are typically not seen as redundant, and the phrases state capitalism or crony capitalism are not seen as contradictions. If without controversy, capitalism can take the qualifiers free market and state, that tells us something. This is true regardless of what dictionaries say. From at least the time of Samuel Johnson, lexicographers have understood dictionaries to be descriptive, not prescriptive. New editions routinely modify definitions in light of current usage. This is not just a semantic point. One wonders about the value of spending time arguing whether what we have is really capitalism or not, and it is more than a matter of rhetoric, or the art of persuasion, important as that is. It is a matter of historical understanding— 
For although Ludwig von Mises and Ayn Rand tried mightily to have capitalism understood as the free market, they were swimming upstream. As historian Clarence Carson wrote in The Freeman in the 1980s, capitalism does not have a commonly accepted meaning, proponents of it to the contrary notwithstanding. As matters stand, it cannot be used with precision in discourse. Carson wondered why one would call a system in which production and exchange are carried on privately capitalism. So far as I can make out, he wrote, there is no compelling reason to do so. There is nothing indicated in such arrangements that suggests why capital among the elements of production should be singled out for emphasis. Why not land? Why not labor? Or indeed, why should any of the elements be singled out? There are other curious features of the word. When an ism is added to a word, it denotes a system of belief, and probably what has come to be called an ideology, Carson writes. But a capitalist is not one who advocates capitalism in the way that a socialist is one who advocates socialism. He is rather one who owns capital. A capitalist can be a socialist without contradiction. It is also useful to bear in mind that the word was not initially embraced by free market advocates. That was apparently a 20th century phenomenon. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word capitalist came first and was used pejoratively in the late 18th century. Of course, Marx used it and related words as condemnation, but it was not only opponents of private property who used the words that way. Most notably, Thomas Hodgskin, 1787-1868, a free-market liberal and Herbert Spencer's mentor, preceded Marx in this usage. By capitalist, he meant one who controlled capital and exploited labor as a result of state privilege in violation of the free market. A Short History of Capitalism As important as economic theory is to understanding history, it is no substitute for history. Knowing how free markets work cannot in itself tell us that the free market existed in any given historical period. Mises and Rand notwithstanding, from early on historical capitalism has been associated with government intervention on behalf of landowners and factory owners. Capitalism, of course, is linked to the Industrial Revolution, which began in England, but the rise of industrialism in England followed massive expropriations of yeomen from lands they had struggled to acquire de facto rights over for generations. As another Carson, Kevin Carson, wrote in The Freeman, in the old world, especially Britain, the expropriation of the peasant majority by a politically dominant landed oligarchy took place over several centuries in the late medieval and early modern period. It began with the enclosure of the open fields in the late Middle Ages. Under the Tudors, church fiefdoms, especially monastic lands, were expropriated by the state and distributed among the landed aristocracy. The new owners evicted or rack-rented the peasants. The process continued with land reforms and parliamentary enclosures into the 19th century, turning tillers of the soil, those who mixed their labor with the land, into tenants. Commons were privatized by the state, that is, given to the privileged, at the expense of people who previously had long-standing customary rights in them. Independent subsistence farmers and artisans were left no choice but to farm for someone else or to work in the new factories with some of their income skimmed off by landlords and employers. The proletariat was born, as F.A. Hayek acknowledges. By libertarian standards, that constitutes exploitation because state power lay behind the workers' plight. The opportunity to work in the factories is often presented as a blessing, but it looks less benign when the land theft is recognized. Further, there is evidence that the new factory owners obtained some of their capital from old money interests, but even if that were not so, the industrialists benefited from the state's interference with the yeoman's land rights. Members of the ruling class and observers frequently expressed concern that no one would choose to work for someone else in an unpleasant factory if he could work for himself on the land or as an artisan. They shared the view of the early 19th century British writer E.G. Wakefield, where land is cheap and all men are free, where every one who so pleases can obtain a piece of land for himself, not only is labor very dear, as respects the laborer's share of the product, but the difficulty is to obtain combined labor at any price. In no way did laissez-faire begin at this point. Kevin Carson writes, In addition, Factory employers depended on harsh authoritarian measures by the government to keep labor under control and reduce its bargaining power. 
In England, the laws of settlement, decried by Adam Smith, acted as a sort of internal passport system, preventing workers from traveling outside the parish of their birth without government permission. Thus, workers were prevented from voting with their feet in search of better-paying jobs. The combination laws, which prevented workers from freely associating to bargain with employers, were enforced entirely by administrative law without any protections of common law due process. Thus, the interventionist state tainted the emergence of the industrial age. It would have emerged spontaneously otherwise. As Albert J. Nock wrote, The horrors of England's industrial life in the last, 19th, century furnish a standing brief for addicts of positive intervention. Child labor and woman labor in the mills and mines, Coketown and Mr. Bounderby, starvation wages, killing hours, vile and hazardous conditions of labor, coffin ships officered by ruffians, all these are glibly charged off by reformers and publicists to a regime of rugged individualism, unrestrained competition, and laissez-faire. This is an absurdity on its face, for no such regime ever existed in England. They were due to the state's primary intervention, whereby the population of England was expropriated from the land, due to the state's removal of land from competition with industry for labor. Thus, as Kevin Carson writes, Capitalism, arising as a new class society directly from the old class society of the Middle Ages, was founded on an act of robbery as massive as the earlier feudal conquest of the land. From the outset of the Industrial Revolution, what is nostalgically called laissez-faire, was in fact a system of continuing state intervention to subsidize accumulation, guarantee privilege, and maintain work discipline. The taint of government intervention into economic activity carried over to the British North American colonies. The radical nature of the American Revolution has masked the class struggle within American colonial society between what historian Merrill Jensen called radicals and conservatives in his book The Articles of Confederation, an interpretation of the social constitutional history of the American Revolution, 1774 to 1781. Class analysis was not originated by Marx, but by the earlier laissez-faire radicals Charles Comte and Charles de Neuer. A privileged, politically connected elite came to dominate each colony, living off big land grants and taxes. Power and land were handed out as royal favors, and the wealthy recipients became entrenched. In the north, the ruling class consisted of merchants, in the south of the big planters. Jensen notes that in Pennsylvania, for example, the merchants had tried by various means to overthrow the system of markets and auctions in order to get a monopoly of the retail trade. Then, as now, established business preferred cartels to free and unpredictable competition. The elites came to think of themselves as the wise aristocracy destined to govern, and they were not eager to give up power when the radicals first started to push for independence from Britain. Staying in the empire was seen as the key to holding local political power. The radicals and the conservatives thus had different economic and political interests and different views about independence from Great Britain. When British usurpations made continued association with the empire intolerable, even for many conservatives, those groups then disagreed over how the new nation should be governed. The mercantile interests tended to favor nationalist centralization, which was seen as the best way to maintain their power and restrict the radical democrats. They hoped to emulate the British mercantilist system. In contrast, the mass of people who felt themselves imposed upon by those interests tended to favor decentralization because they believed they had a better chance for justice and property with local self-government. Thus, what Jensen calls the internal revolution, the effort to break the hold of the elites in the colonies, was at least as important as the external one against the British. The Constitution Given this pre-independence picture, it should come as no surprise that independent America was no bastion of laissez-faire libertarianism. Indeed, the effort to overthrow the Articles of Confederation, with its weak central quasi-government that lacked the power to tax the people directly or regulate trade, and establish a far stronger central government under the U.S. Constitution, was a continuation of the internal struggle that had occurred before the Revolution. To give just one indication here, it is erroneously believed that the driving force behind the Constitution was the determination to create a free trade zone among the states. 
Thus, according to the Standard Account, the Commerce Clause was the response to widespread trade barriers between the states. But several problems present themselves. First, the United States were already a free trade zone, with the exception of rare restrictions on European goods passing from one state to another. Second, in arguing for ratification of the Constitution in the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton complained that tariffs were too low, not too high. It is therefore evident that one national government would be able, at much less expense, to extend the duties on imports beyond comparison further than would be practicable to the states separately or to any partial confederacies. Hitherto, I believe it may safely be asserted that these duties have not, upon an average, exceeded in any state three percent. There seems to be nothing to hinder their being increased in this country to at least treble their present amount. Federalist Twelve emphasis added. In other words, competition among the states was keeping tariffs down, while uniting the states under a strong central government would curb that competition, cartel style, and permit higher tariffs. Indeed, the first economic act of the new Congress in 1789 on July 4th was a comprehensive protective tariff ranging from five to ten percent. It was called the Second Declaration of Independence. Third, historian Calvin Johnson notes, in the original debates over adoption of the Constitution, regulation of commerce was used almost exclusively as a cover of words for specific mercantilist proposals related to deep water shipping and foreign trade. The Constitution was written before Adam Smith, laissez-faire, and free trade came to dominate economic thinking, and the Commerce Clause draws its original meaning from the preceding mercantilist tradition. Barriers on interstate commerce, however, were not a notable issue in the original debates. Emphasis added. Thomas Jefferson's philosophy of decentralization might have been the philosophy of the people, but powerful elites throughout the new states were in Hamilton's camp. As a result, government intervention in critical parts of the economy, internal improvements, and later subsidies to railroads was prominent. When Jefferson and later Jeffersonians gained power, they were able to reverse some of the damage. But the nationalism and statism of Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay were always in the wings, waiting for a Lincoln to be elected. Distributing land. A revealing story is to be found in the disposition of federal lands. As noted, political favoritism and land speculation yielding fortunes were scandalous in the colonial period. Things changed little after the Revolution. Despite the impression given by the Homestead Act of 1862, most land, and certainly the best land, was given or sold on sweetheart terms to influential economic interests, most prominently but not exclusively the railroad interests. Needless to say, the landless and powerless were not among the buyers. As historian Paul Wallace Gates wrote in 1935, the Homestead Law did not completely change our land system. Its adoption merely superimposed upon the old land system a principle out of harmony with it. It will appear that the Homestead Law did not end the auction system or cash sales, as is generally assumed. That speculation and land monopolization continued after its adoption as widely, perhaps, as before. And within, as well as without the law, that actual homesteading was generally confined to the less desirable lands distant from railroad lines, and that farm tenancy developed in frontier communities in many instances as a result of the monopolization of the land. The large land holdings produced by this policy, parts of which were kept idle, limited the opportunities of those without power and influence, increasing their dependence on employers and landlords. The situation thus bears some resemblance to that in England. Aside from the land issue, we know from the work of Jonathan R. T. Hughes and others that from the beginning, government entwinement in the economies of the colonies and states was common. Hughes wrote in the governmental habit redo, "The relevant history extends back to the New Deal. A few go back further into the late nineteenth century, but in fact, the powerful and continuous habit of non-market control in our economy reaches back for centuries." Thus, during the colonial period, virtually every aspect of economic life was subject to non-market controls. Some of this tradition would not survive; some would become even more powerful, while some would ascend to the level of federal control. 
The colonial background was like an institutional gene pool. Most of the colonial institutions and practices live on today in some form, and there is very little in the way of non-market control that does not have a colonial or English forerunner. American history did not begin in 1776. The Expansion of Capitalism Reviewing a couple of dozen studies of state and local economic intervention in the 19th century, historian Robert Lively concluded in 1955, King laissez-faire, then, was, according to these reports, not only dead, the hallowed report of his reign had all been a mistake. The error was one of monumental proportions, a mixture of overlooked data, interested distortion, and persistent preconception. The substantial energies of government were employed more often for help than for hindrance to enterprise. The broad and well-documented theme reviewed here is that of public support for business development. In the second half of the 19th century, America moved further from, not closer to, laissez-faire, thanks to Lincoln's adoption of Henry Clay's statist American system, which included a national bank, internal improvements, tariffs, and for a while an income tax. As Joseph R. Stromberg writes, in truth, the Gilded Age witnessed a great barbecue, to use Vernon Louis Parrington's phrase, rooted in the rampant statism of the war years, whose participants defended themselves with Spencerian rhetoric while grasping with both hands. The 20th century only accelerated this process by shifting it further to the national level. Big business's complicity in the progressive era reforms is well documented, thanks to Gabriel Kolko and others. If you count favors for major businesses as government intervention, then there was no laissez-faire in the 20th century, even during the Harding Coolidge years. Herbert Hoover's interventionist record is well known, and it ought to be understood that big business supported Franklin Roosevelt's election in 1932 and his administration during its initial period. The corporatist National Recovery Administration was much to its liking and for some didn't go far enough. If one believes that in the throes of the Depression, America might have embraced explicit nationalization of the means of production, then one can conclude that Roosevelt did indeed save capitalism, but not in the sense of the free market, which had already been compromised virtually beyond recognition. The upshot is that historical capitalism was not the free market. Rather, it was an anti-competitive, pro-business system of controls and subsidies in which government and mercantile interests worked together in a misguided attempt to produce economic growth and to promote the fortunes of specific, well-connected interests. As in any period, there are rent-seekers and obliging rulers, with a revolving door between the two groups. But it is important to note that there was no attempt at comprehensive economic planning. Thus, there was scope for entrepreneurship, which needs little encouragement to flourish. By historical standards, the burden of government was light. Grass sprouts through the cracks in the sidewalk. A little economic freedom goes a long way. This historical account is relevant to understanding the basis from which the U.S. economy evolved and to realizing that the trajectory of development has been different from what it would have been had a real free market existed. Privilege has had long-lasting effects, which we still feel today owing to what Kevin Carson calls the subsidy of history. Thus, those who call today's system capitalism cannot be said to be misusing the term. Advocates of the real free market, therefore, would be well advised to avoid using it to describe their preferred social system.